Hello, welcome to Forest Horizons Whistle Factory. Come in and have a look. Um, so what I'm going to show you today is I'm going to show you how to make these whistles. So we've been making, making these whistles, um, or I've been making these whistles as part of uh, our community project with the um, Shed. So these whistles are going to go out to the community project members, um, some of whom might be kind of stuck at home. Um, you know, isolating and all that sort of stuff. So it's a nice little funky thing to do that can be done at a great big social distance from everybody else. So have a look at this. We've got a whistle here around my neck. Um, so this is made of hazel. Bit of pyrography going on there. I've just put some letters on that. I mean, that's MSUK. That's me, um, Mushroom Spotters UK Facebook group. But we can put anything on there. Um, you know, there's uh, there's Maeve's whistle look and Harry's whistle and so on. Oh, look. There's my whistle with a few mushrooms. And these are all made of um, Lancashire coppiced hazel. But what we're going to do is we're going to show you how to make these whistles to start off with out of broom steels. The only reason being is that it takes a bit of time and effort to go and coppice a nice load of hazel. And you don't just want to go cutting it up and wasting it while you practice and get used to how to make a whistle. So you can start off with broom steels because they're cheap. Um, equipment that we need. So we need a few broom steels. We need the jigs and this is the important part of the kit. So jig number one. You can see what's going on there. I've got different size holes for different size whistles and they're just bound together with a piece of leather and the idea of that is that I can position the whistle in there and I can hold it tight put it in that one there we go i've got a good grip on that now and that just means that when i'm drilling it when i drill down there it's a lot safer than doing it by hand where i could slip off and go into my own into my own flesh so it just uh, it's my little safety jig and also this one pretty simple i've got a 45 degree angle there we've got a little shelf to uh, to rest the whistle against this can be used right handed like so or left handed like so I'm right handed I'm going to use it that way around and this holds the whistle in place while I make the two cuts one down here and one down there other equipment we need is very important glasses so I can see what I'm doing if you're of a certain age you'll need them like me um, and a cup of tea is very 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 important Um, pencil, a saw. Do you know what? There's better saws than this. This is only a cheap thing, but you're going to get provided with one of these with the whistle kit when you buy the whistle kit, and it'll do. And it's just it's a hacksaw, but it's got a wood cutting blade on it, and it's fine for doing these whistles. Absolutely fine. We've got the blanks. We've got some sample whistles there. We've got a few drill bits. So I've got a four mil bit. So that does the first hole. And then I've got a, a little selection here, 9mm, 9.1mm, 9.5mm. A few slightly different sizes there because this is going to be cut into the reed. And the reed is that little insert there. The reed is the bit that does the magic and makes it do that. We've got some glue, health and safety glue. Health and safety glue because when I put the reed in there and then you take it home and your home has got a different moisture content than my garden and my workshop and the timber dries a bit further and the reed goes a bit loose you don't go <gasps> and then it goes down your throat <laughs> so the health and safety glue holds the reed in place and then finally is a little knife to finish off with again same as I saw there's better knives than this around bushcraft knives and what have you um, I tend to use my Mora knife for this sort of stuff and I can just peel away like this and this is this is how I finish it off. Um, but for all the sake of the kit that you're going to receive, we've included a little knife in there. Feel free to use any of the knife of your own. Um, you'll notice it's got a nice rounded end and that's again an health and safety thing so you can't accidentally stab yourself with a knife that we provided. Good stuff. And I think we're pretty much ready. 
Okay, right. I need jig number one. You'll notice that the blanks that we're providing come pre-drilled. I've already drilled them. Now the reason I've already drilled them is if you start with an undrilled blank, oops, let's turn it around so it would be undrilled on that side, and you start off with a 4mm drill bit, and you go through there. And what you do is you first of all try and find yourself a centre. Just tighten it up, trust your eyes, trust your judgement. There, I'm happy with that centre. Don't know if you can see the pencil marks on that. A bit closer. A bit closer. Yep. Okay, I'm quite happy with that. And you notice how we did it. It's quite easy, or it's a lot easier for my eyes to judge something side to side, to judge a centre side to side to side to side. If I say, where's the centre of that? You'll tell me, and it'll be pretty accurate. But if I turn it round and say, where's the centre of that? It's quite difficult for our for, for, for us to judge that sort of distance going away from us or coming towards us. So I judge it side to side there, side to side there, and then I get my cross. Okay. I would then take this and from there drill. Now keeping that perfectly vertical isn't the easiest thing in the world. So that's why I pre-drilled them. Like so. Okay, so I've already got a 4mm, I've already pre drilled with a 4mm bit and with a 7mm bit. So now they're ready for reaming out and they need to be able to take this reed. Now the reed is 9mm in theory, that's what it says on the label, 9mm. Um, they do kind of alter a little bit according to moisture content of the atmosphere around us and stuff like that. So that's why you're going to get a 9mm, a 9.1mm and a 9.5mm drill bit. I'm going for the 9.1 straight away. You might want to, want to try the 9 first and then ream it out a bit further to the 9.1. I'm going to go straight for the 9.1 because I think that's the right one. There we go. So a drill bit in the drill. Whistle blank clamped. Cup of tea away. And just make sure. Well, it took a tiny bit out there. I think I've already done that to 9mm, and now I'll just take it to 9.1. But what I do want to do is I want to make sure I'm going no further than 45mm. And I can see from where my where the wood is there that I've just taken out. There you go, there's the last little bit that I've got me 45mm. These are already to a 45mm depth, so when you're drilling you'll feel it bottom out at your 45mm depth, because they're already drilled to there, all you're doing is reaming out. If you bottom out and then push further, obviously you can go all the way through, if, if you really want to. The deeper you go, the deeper the whistle noise. Yeah, so you can experiment with that a little bit and make different pitches on your whistle. Um, another good thing you can do is just get a piece of masking tape and put it round your drill so you've got your, your measurement, your depth guide. Okay. Take that out of there. Right, that's that jig done with. We're now on the next, the next jig. Okay. Have a look at that hole. It's not quite perfectly central, and there we are. I try and get them as central as I can, but they're never perfect. So I'm going to judge, I think it's closest to there. I think that's the top of the whistle. I think that's where it's closest to the edge, if it's slightly off centre. So I'm just going to put a load of mark there. Sometimes it's a bit more obvious. Let's have a look. There, look at that one. If I was doing that one, then that would definitely be going there, not there. The only reason for that, it'd still work if I did it on that side, it's just that I'd be cutting all so, through so much material that I'd weaken it. And more chance of getting it wrong. So, putting that at the top, you will notice on your jig that I've put a little saw mark in. And that's so you can gauge where to cut this. So I'm lining up with the end, I'm lining up just by closing one eye. So I close, I close one eye and I look down the blade of the saw and I 
line up with that saw mark and start sawing. And I want to go halfway through the hole. So what I do is I look down there and I think, can I see the blade? No, I can't even see it yet, so I'm not even into the hole. Just see the saw blade now. Oh, keep looking. There. Now I don't know if that screen is going to be able to look down there and see the blade. Yeah, Ruby's nodding. She can see the blade. You can see that it's halfway through. Okay. Good stuff. Right, keeping that in place, I'm now going to position it on there, all the way to the bottom. And what I'm doing is, I'm looking again, and I'm looking at the very bottom of this saw cut where the teeth of the blade are. I'm keeping that in my mind, lift the blade out, and I now want to go straight down vertically with a cut that's going to meet the bottom of the cut that I've just made. Yep. So what it's going to do is it's going to come from here vertically down to there like that on both sides Yep. Yeah. You really feel that you want to you can try and pencil mark it like that, but I don't think you should need to And straight down vertically So this is a 45 degree cut bottom the saw's not quite got the last little bit so I'm just going to clean that up a little bit with the saw uh, sorry with the knife you can see how I hold the knife kind of hold it with that hand and I've got my thumb on the back of the blade and I kind of give it a little gentle push with my thumb on the back of the blade and it's nice and controlled and I'm not kind of going like this where it might slip and cause damage to somebody, to me or somebody else. That's a little bit better. The saw, if you do want to get yourself a better saw for doing this, then a little Japanese pole saw is absolutely ideal for this. A really nice fine cut, really nice control, and um, once you get used to them, they're, they're a lovely thing to use as Japanese pole saws. Have a, have a Google for Japanese pole saws. Okay, no whistle yet. No, I need this. Right, on the top end of this jig is a hole all the way through. And what I can do is I can insert that into the hole. You see it comes out the other side. Oh look, there's a saw cut there. Oh look, that fits in the saw cut. Lo and behold, Oh, low and behold, there is, oops, there is the first bit of my reed. That's what I'm going to make my reed out of, the whistle reed. Put that back. Okay, lie this on its side, and now what you've got, as well as that hole, is another hole. And that's just to hold it in place. It's, a, it's another. It's another health and safety thing. We've got the health and safety glue. And we've got the health and safe reed. Health and safety reed hole. 
Um, and that's because if I put this here and I start trying to chop, I might just make a mistake and hurt myself. It holds it while I chop. Now what I want to do is, can you see where I've positioned that knife? It's not centre. That's about centre. So I'm a little bit off centre. So one side's bigger than the other side. And I want to go at an angle. Because I want a tapered cut. Oh, there we go. Let's see if that's done it. Ooh, there's not much of a taper to that. So what I can do is put it back in the safety hole. And I can go in like that. And now I can bring it out now that I've got the cut. There we go. That should do. Ooh, and you know what I've not got with me right now while we're filming is a little piece of sandpaper. Let's hope I don't need it because actually a little piece of sandpaper and a little rub on a piece of sandpaper is the ideal thing to do now. And you will have a little piece of sandpaper in your kit. I forgot it. Okay. What we do now is we insert that. Biggest end first. Into there. It should be a nice tight fit. Yes, there we go. That's a nice tight fit. Can you see? I've put it in there. And you can just see it poking through there. Just with the knife, I'm just going to give it a little push back and put it level. Level with the cut. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't work, I can riddle about with the reed. Hey! There's the magic. <laughs> so if it didn't work, what I can do is I can try pushing it a bit deeper. Can you hear it doesn't work there? So sometimes messing about with the depth of the reed makes a difference. But actually, perfect position. Do not forget that now needs to come back out and I need to just put a dab of health and safety glue onto there for the reed. Doesn't need an awful lot, I don't want to drown it. I just want to make sure that that reed glues in place so that nobody's going to swallow that reed accidentally. I've still got a little bit of reed sticking out so I can tidy that up back on the jig. Now this isn't very nice on the lips, a big square cut like that, so I'm just going to do this. Can you see again, I'm holding the knife like so, my thumb's just on the back of the blade, but my other thumb's also on the back of the blade, holding it to my body. I'm not holding it out here, I don't want you to do this, I don't want anybody going like this and giving it cuts like that, because it's not controlled at all. It slips, it slips and cuts you, it slips and cuts somebody else. You know it's not good you hold it to yourself so that as the knife slips through the wood i'm, I'm controlling if, if it's if there's any sudden movement my arms are locked and i'm controlling it with my thumbs on the back of the blade and when you're not used to using a knife for whittling this seems really like unnatural y you want to just do this because it seems like you can get a better grip and a better push and get used to it because once you've got used to it it's miles better way of doing it so I'm just going to go around and take off this edge. Um, the old bodgers, the old, the old, the old traditional bodgers, used to call this this type of thing an act of kindness. You put an act of kindness on it, taking off the sharp edges, making sure it feels nice to the touch. And I can keep going with that until I'm happy with it. Okay. Here's one I made earlier, just like Blue Peter. Slightly deeper whistle on that one, so I must have gone a bit deeper with the with the, with the drill. An experiment with them. If if you cock it up totally, that blank isn't wasted. You can have a go at the other end, but you are going to have to do your first pilot hole. And all it's just a case of making sure your drills very very vertical, and you're not drilling on a on a funny angle. Um, a little bench top pillar drill is the perfect thing for that but obviously not everybody's got one of them at home um they're a nice little cheap thing really they're only you know sort of 30 quid and very very useful 
um, in a shed for somebody who's doing a bit of woodworking. So once you've got used to that and you've got your whistles and you think, think you've mastered it, you, you really want to do them out of hazel because with the bark on it's beautiful. You can do them out of willow, but willow bark off. But then you get this white whistle that looks quite, 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 quite attractive. Um, and willow gives a really nice round noise, rounded noise. There's just something better about the tone of it. Um, than the, in fact, I've got some here. So these are all willow ones. But I don't think I've got any completed willow ones that are going to whistle for you. But these are willow whistles. So they're quite, you know, they're quite nice. Just a, a wooden whistle that's, that's a bit nicer than, uh, than a broom steel. You can see I've got different sizes, different thicknesses. So let's just measure them up. These willow ones are going down to the minimum. You don't want to do anything less than these. These are 20 mil. I mean, that's a bit on the skinny side. You might struggle doing a 20 mil. Um, these hazel ones are perfect. These are the perfect size and they should be 25 mil. Yeah, that's spot on 25 mil. So a 25 mil piece of hazel. These broom steels are 28 mil, which is getting a bit on the chunky side, but they're alright for practicing. So the next stage, which I will do another little video, is to go for a walk in the woods and have a look for hazel staffs. They're a very useful thing, hazel staffs, because you can use it as a staff. But you can also cut your whistles out of it. So this staff, I wouldn't use this bumpy knobbly bit here. I'm going to get a whistle out of that bit there, because that's one. Avoid that bump. Mm. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Bit of a bend there, so I'll go about eight. No, we're getting a bit chunky there. Maybe ten. Maybe ten whistles out of there. So as a bodger, with an array of goods made from local coppice materials, I might get 15 quid for a nice staff. If I get a five or a whistle, and I turn that staff into 10 whistles, I'm doing a lot better at a whistle than staffs, aren't I? <laughs> so, that's the whistle kit. That's the Forest Horizons whistle kit. Um, We're going to put the kits in bags, like a full set in a bag, uh, ready to be sent out. Um, if you're a member of um, a Tongue and a Hoff big local uh, community group, the Pottering Shed, um, it's not restricted to any age, it's not restricted to any gender or anything like that, it's just basically come and potter, come and potter and see what you fancy doing. Um, so before we went into lockdown and global pandemic and all that sort of stuff, we just had a group of people coming doing various, various bits of woodwork couple of people outside doing bits of gardening and stuff like that um, the main thing is you come and have a cup of tea and a chat um, but just whatever you want to do um, there's some quite advanced woodworking going on there some people are just making like boxes for growing stuff in the garden whatever you want to do um, since the global pandemic quite a few people are isolating for very good reasons so I'm hoping this will give you a bit of something to you know reconnect you with the pottery shed again and, uh, and make you feel um, like you've got something to uh, to, uh, to, 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 to be doing in the meantime. Um, um, the other thing we're doing is we're we'll at St Chad's Church. Uh, we're doing a community garden there because we can do that outdoors. So because it's an outdoor space, we can do activities there. So a bit of gardening, raised beds, all that sort of stuff. And at the moment, uh, we're building a big wooden gazebo, round gazebo that's not gonna be too dissimilar to this, except this isn't round. So if you just pan out a bit and have a look at the roof, we've got a shingle roofed. Yeah, so the wooden shingle roof tiles. So a nice big round gazebo with wooden shingle roof tiles is the, uh, the theme of the project at, um, at the Pottery Shed just now. Um, so if you feel like you can, you know, come out of your isolation, or when you feel like you come out of your isolation, or anybody else in, you know, Tonganhof area of Bolton um, who wants to get involved. Um, get in touch and we'll look at our numbers because we're restricted to numbers obviously but we'll see what we can do and uh, come and get involved place your orders for the whistle kit nice one. Oh. <laughs>